Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting number 12 for Agricultural Affairs Committee, April 4 this morning. What a beautiful morning to be here. It was an uh, amazing drive to get here. We'd like to thank all the city staff and the plow operator that they work overnight to keep the road uh, clean. So for us to be able to be here. So welcome to the people in the gallery and the people online. So uh, before we start the meeting, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this meeting is being held on unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory. The people of the Anishinaabe Algonquin nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. I'd like to ask Kelly to do roll call, please. Councillor Brown? Here. Councillor Kitts? Here. Councillor Lulov? Je present. Vice Chair Kelly? Present. And Chair, you have quorum. Uh, thank you. i also like to welcome uh, my colleague, Wilson Law to be here with us on in the gallery this morning. Let's give him a big, big welcome, make him feel welcome at the Rural Affairs Committee. Thank you very much, Councillor, for being here with us this morning. Uh, 3.1, ERAC Minute uh, 11, Thursday, March 7, 2024. Is that carried? Carried. Thank you. Uh, we have a response to inquiry, but uh, I heard from uh, some of my colleagues we want to hold it. For us to hold it, we have a technical, we have a motion, procedural motion. Councilor Clark Kelly, can you please move, read it for us? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw being bylaw, whatever, the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee approved that the rule procedure be suspended to allow for consideration of the items listed as responses to inquiry ARAC 2024-01 warranted traffic signals and funding. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll come back to this one. Uh, number five, 5.1, we have a rural summit update and presentations. Uh, we have Stefan Galibo here, but we're going to wait. We're going to hold it till, uh, till after. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, number six, 6.1, we also have Rural Building Grant Program. We're going to hold that one. Uh, we have additional item. Councillor Brown has a motion for Georgia Falls Trust Fund allocation. So, Mr. Councillor Brown, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. That the following motion be added to the agenda pursuant to subsection 89, paragraph 3 of the procedure bylaw, such that it may rise to council quickly in order to accommodate for early planting season, perhaps not today, Chair. Whereas the Georgina Falls Trust Fund was established for the purposes of funding improvements to the Manatic Arena and Centennial Park, and whereas bylaw 85-92 of the former Rideau Township governs the administration of this trust, and whereas in accordance with the bylaw, the amount expended from the trust shall be limited to the interest earned, and the fund shall not be reduced to less than the bequeathed amount of $65,628. And whereas financial services have, has confirmed that the trust has a current balance of $70,651.64, therefore be it resolved that City Council approve an allocation from the trust fund of $2,500 to the Manatic Community Parks and Recreation Association for landscaping improvements at the Manatic Arena, and be it further resolved that the General Manager of Recreation, Culture and Facility Services be delegated to approve further allocations from the trust fund that are in compliance with its intended uses and with the concurrence of the Ward 21 Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brown. Any question? Seeing none, is that motion carried? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Thank you, and uh, number seven, we have no in-camera item, and I just want to hit eight, number eight. We have a small IPD, and just to, for information only, uh, Planning, Real Estate, and Economy Development Department 2023 Delegate Authority Report. So thank you for that. And now we're going to go back to our agenda. So we do have... Uh, uh, 4.1, we have some question to staff, and we have Karina Dugos is on the, on the line with us. Good morning, Karina. Hopefully, uh, you have, I can see you here on the screen if I could.
Good morning, Chair. I was just promoted as a panelist. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Good morning, Karina. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I have counsel at the Agricultural Reform Committee. I have a few questions for you. So we're going to start probably with Councillor Brown. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, Karina. I appreciate you attending committee today. Um, based on the information that we received at the last ARAC committee meeting that uh, Councillor Drew uh, put forward, some of the concerns that we've heard from not only members of this committee, but members of the public, is the length of time that some of these intersections have been stuck on the list. Recognizing that the list uh, evolves, it changes over time as new locations are warranted. So the list does get longer over time. It's not finite. How do we move forward on some of these projects and, and recognizing that some of the warrants are lower uh, in the rural area? It, and I appreciate that, but it doesn't seem to move them forward. So how can we make measurable improvements and actually complete some of the work that's on this, uh, on this this through this program for the projects on this list? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I, I see we have some uh, people from traffic that can uh, probably help me uh, a little bit with the answer. Uh, from an infrastructure services perspective, uh, we received the project from our uh, clients in, in traffic services uh, that are the ones that put together the, the list of priority. I see Heidi has uh, turned her camera on. Um, right now, from the list that um, is included in the response, we have three projects under design uh, with infrastructure services. Uh, we do have funding for design um, until funding for construction is um, is approved by um, by the budget that traffic is putting through. And we do have a project on the shelf that I know has been a lot of discussions around, which is the Eagle Sanan Fluellen intersection that has been designed and it is waiting for uh, construction funding. Um, so maybe uh, I'm not sure if it's Heidi or Kathy that can speak to the, um, the systems that uh, we have in place to prioritize and, and how those decisions are made and the funding is coming to us. Yes, oh, good thank morning. you very much. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Kathy. My apologies, sorry, good morning. Through you, Chair, I can add to uh, Karina's response just in terms of our program. So basically within our program, we work within the allocated capital funding for the new traffic control devices program to advance locations to construction. So within the funding that we receive, we have developed a prioritization system that allows us to address the locations where, um, where the concerns are the highest and where the need is there um, the most to address issues such as collisions and high volumes. So we work within our funding envelope to continually progress intersections towards construction. There are a number of steps involved. Once a location does meet the warrants for a traffic signal and is added to the priority list. So the first step is to conduct a functional design study, um, which typically takes from six months to a year. It involves the, an assessment of the appropriate traffic control device, whether a roundabout or a traffic signal is appropriate. It also involves a public consultation phase and a review of property requirements. Uh, those functional design studies are done within our team and traffic services. And as Karina mentioned, once we complete the functional design stage, we hand over the projects to infrastructure services for preliminary and detailed design. Oftentimes we allocate funding towards the design, but we're still saving up over a number of years to have sufficient funding to bring the sites to construction. Well, thank you very much. I guess the concern that I have is simply the amount of funding for the need uh, based on the information we received last month. If you only took the 19 uh, locations in rural Ottawa, it would take 24 years to complete all of those projects. And that's if no other projects get on the list that uh, would receive a higher warranted, um, I guess, funding allocation. And so 
My question, and I don't know if it's uh, best addressed to you or somebody in finance services, but is there a conversation that we should be having at this committee and council about allocating additional resources? Because taking 24 years to complete 19 locations doesn't seem reasonable, and that's not including the 17 locations that are currently on the list for urban Ottawa. So do we need to talk about a, a serious funding allocation so we can move forward in a way that the public actually sees some progress being made? Yeah, so this this may be a greater question for for with our financial services uh, team. We 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 don't decide the budget envelopes that we we get yet every year. Those are dictated to us, and then therefore we have to prioritize our projects within that, recognizing that this program in, in particular has had a long queue. There has been funding um, identified through the road safety action plan to help supplement it. Um, we foresee that continuing as well in the future years, and and as was described in the inquiry, um, we anticipate. Uh, um, additional uh, resources happening through the, the through those programs that should be able to help us supplement this program even further. Um, but we don't the we work within the, the the budget envelopes that are provided to us. Nope. Thank you very much. And I, I think uh, moving forward, that's a conversation that I certainly would like to have, and I think the, my colleagues as well. So I appreciate staff taking the time to attend today. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have, next will be Councillor Clark Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to Councillor Brown for bringing this forward and for for his comments, which I I do agree with. And um, I this might not be true, but I the way I interpreted what I just heard, it did sound some like it was a bit conflicting. So you you're talking about Kathy was talking about you know uh, funding envelopes for design um, and looking at the various intersections or or what tools we would use uh and then i believe kathy you used the term um saving money for those projects um is what i heard you say so but but then heidi talked about not having funding at all so i just was wondering if we could get that clarified um and if there is a, some sort of savings happening to you know get enough money for each of these projects. How does that work? And, and are you putting money aside each year for each of these projects? Is there a percentage each year that's being put aside so we can ensure that there's money for those warranted projects? Um, Kathy, I can start and you can you can uh, clarify it. Um, but um, so we, in the budget book, we identify the projects that are sort of above the cutoff line. And, and we, we identify those that are receiving money just for the design per portion so that they can advance through the design. Uh, we also identify which projects are receiving money for construction. And sometimes it may take multiple years to build up enough money for that particular construction project. So sometimes within that budget allocation that we're receiving, we, we want to continue proceeding, moving forward some design projects. We don't want to sort of stall everything in, in the event of sometimes there may be additional funding sources that become available, like like um, other levels of government stimulus programs and things like that. We want to have some design right shovel ready sort of projects um and but we also have to sort of build up our coffers for the the construction so we're we're all constantly sort of allocating um towards all stages of of multiple projects i guess it's the building up of the coffers that i'm looking for clarification on so are there coffers currently that have money in it waiting to be spent on these intersections in rural areas Matthew, if you can correct me, but I believe that in the 2024 budget, uh, there was some money that was put towards the construction of one of the intersections, but it were recognized that it would need um, um, additional budget years as well to come up with the, the full construction value. That's correct. There I, would be I, some sort of cost center associated with that funding so that it can definitely be paired absolutely. with the project that it's being saved. Absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Um, but you just have one of those or is there, is there multiple that like, could you provide us with uh, a list of those and, and how much is put aside for each of those projects now? Maybe I could jump in, Heidi. Um, I don't think we can't provide the lists at the moment, but that's something we could follow up with. But just to clarify, so this is the funding that we received to the, to the new traffic control devices program. 
So for example, if we allocate a portion of the funding we receive within a particular year to a project such as Barnsdale and Rideau Valley, uh, knowing that we won't have enough for construction within that year, but we'll have to allocate, for example, more funding out of the 2025 budget to go towards construction. So that's sort of what we're referring to, as well as the additional funds that we've already put aside through the Road Safety Action Plan, uh, $3 million to contribute towards bringing the locations to construction. So we're referring to two different um, programs. Thank you very much, Mr. Jack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark Kelly. And we're going to move to Councillor Catherine Kurt. And thank you, Chair. Please excuse my voice. I'm not sick, but I have some laryngitis or something. Um, so, yeah, th thanks. I think this is an important conversation to have. Um, I was happy to see one of the Ward 19 intersections that's on the list. Uh, it's been warranted for seven years. Is moving forward this year to detailed design. But what I what I think I'm hearing from you is that. Um, it's not necessarily that once detailed design is complete, that construction would happen in the year following. Is that is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, through you, Chair. Thank you. That's correct, Councilor Kitts. And do you have like a like an average of how long it takes from the time detailed design is complete until you get shovels in the ground? Uh, no, unfortunately, I don't have an average as it varies from site to site, um, depending on a, on a number of factors, which could include property requirements. So it would vary. It's very site specific. Okay. Um, and are there other funding opportunities um, that could be applied to this program that you could could identify? Thank you for the question through you, Chair. Um, yes, we have identified through our road safety action plan under the em intersections emphasis area, we are directing some of the funding to supplement our new traffic control devices program. And we okay. see that funding growing over time. And it's outside the road safety action plan. There's no other funding opportunities uh, that you can think of. Not a, no, not at this time. Chair, maybe I can I can add uh, in infrastructure services. We have a team uh, that is monitoring uh, municipal, uh, sorry, provincial and federal government programs. So we have a stimulus team that is constantly looking at opportunities. So when we find programs uh, where the scope um, allows us to to build intersections and we have done it in the past you may recall the icip uh 2020 um we build a lot of uh, intersections with that program uh we connect with uh our colleagues in traffic and we provide the information so they can prioritize uh what are those intersections that we can apply for those programs so while within the city uh, we may have some limitations based on what Ms. Uh, Kuroma explained. We are uh, on ongoing monitoring of additional level of governments to be able to uh, make use of those shovel-ready projects that we have because the signs have been completed or are close to completion. Okay. And typically when those opportunities uh, present themselves, you do get input from counselors um, prior to submitting the the packet. Yeah, I know typically there's like a package that goes in on behalf of the city. Thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, we 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 normally have conversations with counselors. Uh, at the same time, we uh, we make sure that everybody understands that we are also following the priorities that the city has in place. So we wouldn't be adding projects that have not been identified uh, in in the in the in the CD list. So projects that we usually apply, we use this program for are projects that council is pretty familiar with because they are in the list of needs that are required coming up. Yeah, no, thanks. I think it's important just from an, not, not to say to, you know, reorganize the list per se, but from an awareness point of view, to just know that, you know, these projects are top of mind and that we're leveraging sort of all the opportunities possible. Um, 
but I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kitt. Uh, Councillor Law. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. Um, the, the most striking thing when you when you look at that list of warranted uh, signal locations across the city, both rural and urban, is the fact that Eagleson and Flewellen has been there since 2008, and there are other locations that have been there for my math is bad, so eight nine years now. So you know the, these locations have been there, and and we know we've needed them for a long time. Um, whenever we Whenever we get the warrants, whenever we find, sorry, whenever the assessment shows that the warrant is there, um, it takes a lot to undo it if, if you, let's say you don't want the stop sign there. It takes a lot and then there's a whole legal thing, there's a whole litigation that comes up because it opens us up to a lot of risk. So in terms of these locations that have been there for um, you know, Eagles and fluellen has been there since I, like that, I was in grade 11 in 2008. So in terms of places that have been there since 2008 and that get uh, that gets sort of pushed down by new places that are new locations that are prioritized, does that open us does that open up the city to any extra risk in terms of um, liabilities by by continually pushing down a location in favor of another location? Thank you for the question uh, through you, Chair. Um, I can provide some information related to the prioritization method that we use. So it's we've developed that method for to prioritize the highest risk locations. So the 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 way the locations are prioritized, we looked at at the level of warrant criteria met uh, following the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario um, traffic manual warrant criteria for the justification of traffic signals. Within that criteria, it looks at the, um, the minimum volume warrant, as well as delays to cross street, which also considers pedestrian volumes. It looks at the collision experience ex at the intersection itself over a three year period. So the prioritization of signals looks at how high or how severe the conditions exist at each of the location and reprioritize based on that information. Um, so by considering these factors, we're looking at areas that are the most risk to road users, including drivers, passengers, vulnerable road users. And of course, the, the rankings will fluctuate over time as um, conditions change and new data is collected. Thank you. Thanks for that um, follow up, I guess. I don't know if this committee works differently. Um, the I, I yeah I understand that and and the thing for me is like I I've gotten the whole um, a, a good briefing from one of your colleagues before about the assessment process, and my understanding is every single location has a score hundred percent to be determined uh, to be deemed you know warranted for a traffic signal. So within the where when every location is scored at a hundred percent, like how 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 does that then get prioritized? Um, like how how is a hundred percent at Eagles and Flewellen different from a hundred percent at Conroy and Davidson, let's say? Um, and then second, um, the risk I was actually referring to was more so the risk of liability for having a location there for sixteen years and go unaddressed. So in terms of the percentage warranted, so once a location uh, reaches that 100%, it is on the list, but this is where we get into the various elements of the warrant criteria. So those can vary uh, uh, among the different sites. So one criteria could be higher or lower than another within that 100% warrant. That's why we, we've developed a system to be able to prioritize based on all the factors that contribute to that 100% ranking. And then in terms of increased risk, in terms of liability for having a place uh, get warranted for so long, is, that, uh, is there any information on that? I see uh, Christine is online. Probably she can answer that question for you, Councillor. Mr. Chair, I do apologize if you can't hear me. I I am ill. Um, the um, 
There are a number of factors, Chair, that go into a determination of negligence and liability in terms of a traffic incident and standards. Um, while it is not my area of expertise at this committee today, uh, if you wish it, Chair, I can speak with our litigation team and we can provide a, a response to the, a, a more a uh, definitive response to the councillor's question uh, prior to council, um, as well as looking at whether or not there have been any claims that were brought to the city that um, provided those allegations that the city was aware of a situation and did not take steps to correct it. Um, Mr. Chair, if you want to give me that direction. Uh, thank you very much. Are you okay with that? So can, yeah, can we please uh, have a direction to staff to go back to uh, not only to the council, if you come back to the whole committee, that will be good. I will. Thank you, Chair. I, I hope you feel better. Thank you very much. Thank Christine. you. Councillor, you're good. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to move to Councillor uh, Matthew Luloff. He's with us online. Councillor Luloff, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, my, my questions uh, originally were around liability as well, so thank you uh, to Councillor Lowe for raising those. Who was in grade 11 in 2008 while I was in Afghanistan, you're making me feel very old today, uh, Councillor Lowe. Uh, what would be the, the total budget required to address the entire list of 100% uh, warranted sites? Hello, through you, Chair. Thank you for the question. Uh, we don't have that figure here today, but that's definitely something we can follow up on. Please, if you don't mind, either um, you know via information distributed to the committee, uh, that that would be good to know. Um, as I think, I could just sorry, I'll just sort of supplement in in the inquiry um, response, the original inquiry response, we did provide a, a very high level amount of approximately sixty five million dollars would be required um, for the. Um, uh, warranted locations in the, the 19 warranted locations in, in the rural ward areas. Um, and that was the, like I said, high level estimate in, in 2024 dollars. And, and what is the, what is the typical, uh, year over year budget to address, um, this list? So the typical year over year budget was $2.7 million. Um, and then in the last few years, we have also been supplementing that with funding from the Road Safety Action Plan with an, an additional $3 million from, from that program. Given that the previous term of council had a direction uh, to have a, an additional 1% um, tax levy uh, to address um, transportation issues and infrastructure issues, was any portion of that uh, allocated uh, to this budget? Or was that simply uh, road resurfacing, um, you know, bridge maintenance, that sort of thing? It's my understanding. Okay. Um, I think we're hearing some concern from the city. Perhaps we can talk offline about what the next budget submission looks like so that we can address some of this list. I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to uh, the return of, uh, of of the chair and, and Councillor Lowe's direction um, on liability, but this certainly seems to be uh, a concern uh, for for all the members of this committee. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Ruloff. Councilor Clark Kelly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, something one of my colleagues said um, in his line of questioning made me think about this, just in terms of the assessment of the intersections and the risk, not liability risk, but risk to individuals using the road um, and, and how that risk is calculated. Because I know the likelihood of a collision may be greater at the corner of Carling and Woodruff, um, but the likelihood of death might be higher at the corner of Dunrobin and March. So because of the speeds that cars get up to in the rural areas, like you're, you're statistically more likely to die in a collision in the rural wards. Is, is that factored in to these decisions or is it just the likelihood of there being a collision uh, or is the seriousness of that collision also factored into these decisions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, Chair. Uh, yes, correct. That's correct. Those those factors are considered in our prioritization process. We consider the roadway speed as well as the environment, whether it's rural or urban. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Uh, definitely, there is uh, interest uh, uh, to have this conversation uh, with the, among not only the rural councillors citywide, and I'm sure the suburban and urban councillors will agree. A uh, question: I'm going to take. I'm going to have a question to where councillor Kit started it, but the funding opportunity that we we really keep talking about it. And probably this question to Karina on a high level. Uh, some of the intersection, um, I understand, if we don't have shovel in the ground, we miss on opportunity. Am I uh, am I correct on that? Thank you for the question, Chair. Uh, every program is different. Uh, so we have um, some programs fund uh, from design throughout into construction. Some programs fund projects that are shovel ready, but we are not allowed to have the construction started. And some programs actually can be retroactive to construction. So it definitely depends on the, the type of program. Uh, and that's why we try to find the project that fits the best to yeah. maximize the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. I, and that's basically because if we don't have we don't spend the money on uh, prepping and getting the warrant and getting the work on the details of the design so probably the funding to get some extra or new money when we have available from federal or provincial government uh, and those are the the project that we actually prepared for those funding am i uh, uh, is that correct thank you for the follow up question uh, chair yes Historically, the, the the programs tend to go to shovel ready. So having a list of projects uh, uh, ready to go for construction on the shelves, it's a good thing for the city. Uh, so the investment on uh, a number of intersections so we can have designs ready to go, it's a wise uh, thing based on the on the historical uh, way of this funding um opportunities to come to the city. We have seen though some projects that fund included the design and some that can be retroactive, but that's not the common. Uh, thank you. And um, why I'm asking all these questions because I'm sure those council the councillors around here and uh, some, lots of councillors listening to this, they're gonna uh, start thinking about how we can really advance. And I looked at the number and uh, Heidi mentioned like those are $65 million in the rural, only in the rural. Uh, intersection and that's not even including or counting uh, a pro some of the challenge on the properties. So uh, this is a very high level, and we know in the city when we uh, project the project never coming on on the construction never come on what we are projecting. So we understand and we know the number is very higher, but I think that what this council is trying to do, they're trying to see if there is extra opportunity for new money or getting our project in line to see those high priority and they're all priority by the way that i'm just talking some of those higher priority that have been waiting for years and years how we can be able to move to move those construction faster so that's basically what the whole conversation and i think i do understand why my counselor colleague but we appreciate you coming here this morning to clarify that but we have a lots of work ahead of us mm -hmm. councilor um, brown and i were discussing this is maybe we have to move it to another discussion on another level with the finance and with the, of course, with the mayor's office. But we really appreciate you, Heidi and Kathy, being here to clarify and give us different pictures. And we'll wait from Christine also for the uh, some of the requests from the inquiry that we, Council Rule just put out, so we can have a better picture on what we have, what what we need to do. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, our presentation 5.1. We have a Stephen Galibo here with us from the Rural Summit team to have a small presentation. I also want to mention that one of our uh, one of our resident that he sits on that board, Mr. Holmes, he's here also. Ken Holmes with us uh, on in the room. And before we go to the presentation, I have a, we have a small motion from Councillor. Uh, Clark Kelly, so we can bring it into the agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Be it resolved that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee waive the rules of procedure, subsection 83, paragraph 4, section A, to receive the presentation from Planning and Real Estate Economic Development Department, Natural Systems and Rural Affairs, regarding an update on the Rural Summit at today's meeting and dispense with the requirement to provide a separate written report on this presentation. 
Carried. Carried. Thank you. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. You're good. There we go. Thank you. There we go. We got it going. Thank well, you. Well, we got it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, committee, for having me today. I'm here to make a presentation on uh, the Rural Summit 2024. My name is Stefan Gallopo. I'm a stakeholder engagement coordinator at the City of Ottawa. Next slide, please. So the City of Ottawa hosted a rural summit back in 2005 and 2008. Uh, and uh, at City Council meeting on December 14, uh, 2002, Councillor Kelly presented a motion uh, regarding the City of Ottawa hosting another rural summit in this term of council. He wanted to highlight the importance of addressing uh, the needs of rural residents and communities, emphasizing the necessity of improving city services in rural Ottawa. So I'm happy to say today that we're going to have the Rural Summit this year in 2024. Our budget uh, for the hosting uh, for the whole year is 50000 Next slide, please. The objective uh, that we want for uh, this rural summit, we want to recommend improvement in the city of Ottawa services for the rural residents. We want to take a look at uh, the current services that they currently receive. We want to explore future plan, future uh, short term, medium term, and long term. We also want to identify what are the opportunities for the, the rural residents. There's uh, we have amazing rural uh, communities. We want to look at opportunities that we can what what can we develop for them, and we also want to listen to them. We want to highlight challenges that uh, we need to that needs to be addressed. Uh, so the targeted areas of so all our rural are ward number one, five, nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. Next slide, please. The first thing we did this year was form a resident working group to help us organize and coordinate the Rural Summit for 2024. Uh, the resident working group was uh, formed in, 20, 20, uh, in January of this year. And it's uh, so it's two members of each rural ward, councillors and C staff. And Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, I would like to uh, mention by name all the residents that are part of the resident working group. Uh, they've been of great help for us, and I want to make sure to mention them today. So from Ward 1, we have Yuri Lukmilis and Steve Lacombe. From Ward 5, we have Shirley Dolan and Ken Holmes, who is with, here with us today. Thanks, you, Ken. From Ward 19, uh, Du Quartier 19, Nous avons Caroline Etter and Glenn Edwards. And from Ward 20, we have Chris Nguyen and Matt Nesrella. And from Ward 21, we have Wendy Eberwin and Megan Ann Gordon. So I want to say thank you to all those residents for being part. It's a lot of work. There have been, uh, we had a lot of meetings uh, to work on the survey that I'm going to talk about in the workshop, and uh, they're going to help us all throughout the year on the resident work uh, for organizing the rural summits. So I want to say a big thank you to all those residents. Next slide, please. For the public engagement where we're at, 
So in uh, in March twenty uh, first of this year, we've launched our uh, survey to not only get gather insight of uh, rural communities, but also help us guide the teams of uh, rural workshop that we're going to have to listen to residents. So we want to find out what are the main challenges that the residents are facing in rural areas. I'm happy to announce today that we have over. Uh, I know on the slide it says three hundred, but now. This was in last week, so uh, this morning we're over 425 response on the surveys, which is excellent. So I want to say thank you to all the residents that have filled the survey, and it's still available on Engage Ottawa. So all those responses is going to help us guide the teams of uh, the rural workshops that we're going to organize all throughout the spring. We're going to have workshop in each rural wards to gain as much feedback as possible from residents. We won't listen to them. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're having the survey. That's why we're doing this workshop. We're going to go to in-person, and it's open to all the residents from those wards to attend and share with us what are the main challenges that they're facing in rural communities and if they have potential solutions that they want to share with us. Next slide, please. I also want to mention that uh, as of uh, this week, we have launched our paper survey. Uh, that also will also be available to all the residents. Uh, we understand sometimes internet might be an issue for some residents, so we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to answer the paper survey. As you can see on this slide, all their, of all the workshops that are going to happen all this spring, uh, so we're starting with uh, Ward 19 workshop that's going to happen next week, and we're going to finish all the way to June with Councillor Kelly's workshop on June 1st. So as you can see, we have workshop that are happening all throughout this spring and that's just the beginning it just we're going to go in person and meet with all the residents but uh the public as you're going to see in the next slide the timeline the public engagement is going to continue past those workshops next slide please and all those workshop and uh the consultation and the outreach will lead to the rural summit 2024 the date we're aiming we're aiming for november as we understand that uh, this would be the best time for the rural residents, as uh, many of them uh, are farmers, uh, have agriculture. So they have, we wanted to make sure that it's the best time for them. Uh, we, the purpose is not only to celebrate rural communities, but also we want to present what we heard and recommend improvement to the provision of the City of Ottawa services to residents and communities of rural Ottawa. So we're pretty excited about this, and it's going to be, I think it's going to be a big celebration, and we're ex we'll be excited to present not only to this committee, but also to the rest of council, everything that we heard from rural residents. Next slide, please. Now, just go over the timeline. It's going to be a pretty big year for uh, rural Ottawa, so... Uh, as you can see here, we're now on the survey, the survey launch, which was done uh, in March. Uh, then we're going to go all the our workshop that are going to happen uh, from April to June, but not that's not going to be the end of our public engagement. We want to go in your community. Uh, we want to listen to them. We understand there's a lot of fairs happening. There's a lot of events happening. Sometimes people cannot come to those workshop or answer the survey, but we want to make sure that we give them plenty of opportunity to share with us uh, the challenges they, they might be facing. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have, we're going to do this all throughout the summer and then around the September. And then we're, our focus is going to turn to the rural summit that we're planning in November. And then we would, would we would report back uh, ideally to committee and council in Q1 2025. And that's the end of my presentation. I really thank you very much, Stefan, for the presentation and for the progress in the work. I, I think uh, Councillor Kelly, uh, Councillor Clark Kelly, have a question, and then we'll move forward with the rest. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the presentation, Stefan, and for your uh, your work on this file so far. Much appreciated. Um, right off the bat, you mentioned the budget of fifty thousand dollars, and uh, I know there's been some work done already, and there's been some printing. Um, could you give us an update on what's been spent so far and uh, where that money has been spent? Yes, absolutely. So there, like you mentioned, there's been the, some printing. Uh, the money uh, 
so the printing has been the major uh thing for as that we spent uh for uh the real summit uh we're gonna have uh we have a budget set for each workshop we want to make sure that our residents feel welcome and uh, at each workshop one make them comfortable and also uh, some advertising that we're going to do uh not only to promote the workshop but also survey the engage ottawa uh site so we're uh we have an advertising plan that uh, has been put in place by Pimmer that uh to promote and we're going to do we're going to spend uh, uh more in uh, the fall to pr to promote uh the rural summit and also and then we have a budget set uh for with uh for the rural summit as well, a big budget, a big portion of the budget is going to go to the rural summit. That's going to happen in November. Just based on spending so far, you're not concerned about the fifty thousand dollar budget. Uh, not at the moment, no. Um, I might be getting a bit ahead of myself here, but I'm already getting excited for what comes after all of this and the reporting and compiling the information and seeing what we heard. So. I was wondering if someone could comment on the reporting process. I'd like to know who will be writing the report, uh, how recommendations will be decided on. Is that going to be, you know, if, if we hear something 80 times and something 60, does the thing we heard 80 times get um, addressed and the thing we heard 60 times not, um, just as an example? And uh, when it comes to the drafting of the report, will there be a counselor role for counselors and the residents from the resident working group? to have input before the report comes to committee and council? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I, I'm I maybe uh, going to turn to Nick uh, regarding the report and uh, the writing, but uh, I, one thing I want to mention is we're going to create, as we heard a report of everything we're going to hear from not only the workshops, but also for everything that we're going to that the residents are going to share with us. Uh, it's going to be fully transparent and we're going to, if uh, every, so everything that uh, residents are going to mention, it's going to be available uh, on not only on Engage Ottawa but uh, on the city website. So it's just uh, we want to be fully transparent about everything we heard uh, from residents. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the um, uh, rural affairs at the moment uh, is. Uh, uh, identified uh, for writing of the uh, the report, um, but as uh, as the committee has made very clear, this is a a councillor led initiative, and so in the drafting of that report, we will be taking our direction from council and from the residents working group. So the content will be coming directly from uh, from you and from the residents. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Brown. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and staff. Thank you very, uh, very much for coming out today. Um, just a moment to thank your team. Uh, it, it's a lot of work and certainly uh, the 10 residents that have come uh, from our wards to, to come together to move this forward. It's very important. As Nick just said, this is councillor driven and we rely heavily on our 10 uh, res uh, residents that have uh, formed our committee to make sure that rural Ottawa knows this isn't just a go away exercise. This is an honest opportunity for rural Ottawa to be heard. And this is an honest opportunity for them to provide valuable input. So changes can be made to address the concerns that we have. Uh, also, I think it's important to mention that if uh, residents in any of the wards can't make their own ward meeting. They're certainly welcome at the other uh, rural workshops. It's important that we get out there. This is one team. Uh, I know we say it often here, but it's true. It's one team, one rural Ottawa. And so it's important that residents have every opportunity to get out to a workshop, even if it isn't your workshop. Uh, so please come out. This is the honest opportunity to be heard, to make improvements that you want to see in rural Ottawa. And again, Steph, thank you uh, very much for coming out today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Kitt. Thank you, Chair. Um, similarly, I just wanted to, to say thank you and commend Councillor Kelly for bringing this forward. I think this is a great initiative. I think it's very important for rural Ottawa, and it's been uh, a really good experience so far. I know this is uh, 
counselor driven, but it's it's resident led. Um, and I I want to thank the the members of the working group. We've we've met frequently. I think you know nearly every week. Um, there's been good communication, good collaboration, and certainly Steph and your team, you've been very responsive. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to commend you. I think people in the community are excited about it. Um, Navin's up first next Wednesday. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to, to setting the bar high. And as, as Councillor Brown said, uh, everyone's welcome. So please come on out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kitt. I just, uh, I don't want to repeat what my colleague, we really thank you. We appreciate the work that yourself and the team and Nick Stowe's, and of course, he's been leading this project. I also don't want to forget to mention Charmaine Forgy that she helped us uh, kick off this uh, summit. Uh, I know she retired and probably she is uh, watching us from far away, but uh, I do appreciate all the effort that staff that put together and of our resident that they've been participating, they've been committing to lots of time to have those meetings. And there is a lots of work is happening behind the scene and very nice and comfortable to hear that we already have 400 answer on a survey and we're looking forward for the engagement and in-person meeting in every rural ward that been participating. And uh, I'm hoping that we can participate in all of them together collectively and then listen and hear like Councillor Brown mentioned, and Council Kidd, this is a councillor driven, but we need the residents' input and we need them to drive this because this is about rural uh, rural uh, policies and rural improvement in our rural area. Uh, I also want to thank Mayor Mayor Sutcliffe and his office been uh, an amazingly uh, involved and engaged in this process and he's been very supportive of any initiative in rural area. I don't want to miss to give him thanks because I know he's been every time he sees us he asks us about where's the progress and everything and I know he's going to be engaged also in rural summit so I want to uh, mention that so thank you very much this morning and I really appreciate we're hoping we'll have a great participation in our in uh, our in person and hopefully you give us a report later too so thank you. Thank you Mr. Chair. Seeing the question, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, we're gonna move to our 6.1. Uh, there is no motion here, but uh, uh, so we have our staff, Ryan, uh, the amazing Ryan Thompson, he's back. And uh, we're so happy to see you here back with us in the gallery, Ryan, you've been great help to us uh, in, the, in, the few, in the past years. And I know that we were so happy to see you back to, uh, to the Rural Affairs Office. Uh, uh, we do have a few uh, report and application. We also have a delegation, but they're only here to sit and they have a question to answer. We have Luke Picknell uh, from Navin Community Association. We also have Leslie Creve from North Gore Garden. I think they are just here to have a, if to answer any question from the committee. So uh, I'll open the floor for the. Councilor Kit, you can go ahead and start. Sure. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I realize that the grant for NABIN is, is a little bit larger than we typically see come through this program. So I want to thank uh, my colleagues for, for their support. This is a, a uh, an important project for, for NAVIN. It has, it's going to have many uses, not only obviously um, for the ice rink, but um, for the, the NAVIN fair board is involved. The agricultural society is involved. I know the market is excited about it um, and it's quite a costly project. So there's a lot of people coming together uh, to make this happen. And, and obviously under the leadership of, of Luke Picknell. So um, I just wanted to, to say thanks in advance and acknowledge that uh, this is slightly a larger request than we typically see. Thank you, Councillor Kitt. Uh, Councillor Brown. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, just a, a comment of thanks uh, for the North Gore gardeners who are coming back to the table uh, to continue to beautify North Gore. Uh, this is building on the good work they've already done. Um, it's all volunteer done, volunteer driven. Um, there's great community support. They go out and fundraise every year. And this is really what makes living in a village nice. You, know, you have volunteers who come together who take pride in their communities and they want to see a little bit more and a little bit better. And uh, the application uh, that's before us today, I don't think it's going to uh, uh, meet any resistance. But I just wanted to say thank you to Leslie and her team for uh, coming together every year uh, throughout the spring, summer and fall to keep North Gore looking at its best. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank also Luke and Leslie. I know that uh, working hard in the community and engaging with councillors and to apply to those rural grants is lots of work. So on behalf of the committee, we thank you. We thank you for your work in our communities in rural areas. Uh, seeing uh, no other questions, uh, the report the recommendation that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee approve the recommendation on rural community building grants program application as detailed in document one. Is that carried? Carried. Well, thank you. Congratulations to Luke and Leslie, and please pass on our uh, great work, the great work you do. Um, we have no. Are we done? Yeah. We have no open session, open mic session. Uh, but we have Councillor Brown here. The number ten is notice of motions. And how many you have? Six. Mm -hmm. So you can only two today, Chair. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Brown. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this is a notice of motion for adjusting the inflation calculation for West River Drive sewer connection charges. Whereas sewer connection charges for certain properties on West River Drive are calculated based on Schedule A, Schedule 1 to Bylaw 2003-513. And whereas the portion of these charges includes consideration for inflation, and whereas inflation has significantly increased since the enactment of the relevant bylaw, and whereas the current high costs are in part a consequence of, of inflation rates in recent years, and whereas these high costs are prohibiting some residents from considering connecting, which diminishes recovery of construction costs, and whereas the city has already paid the full cost of the project back when the initial pipeline was constructed, and as such, a reduction in the inflation calculation would not negatively impact the city. Therefore, be it resolved that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee recommend Council approve that Schedule A, Schedule 1 to Bylaw 2003-513, as enacted by Bylaw 2010-330, be amended to state all charges imposed or continued by this Schedule A shall be indexed annually on January 1st by the increase in Statistics Canada non-residential building construction price index for the preceding October 1 to September 30th period. Despite the provision immediately above for the years 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, and 2025, the indexing to take place on January 1st, subsequent to each year, shall be 2.59% shall be for each of these years. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Your second uh, notice of motion. Thank you, Chair. And uh, with the committee's indulgence, I'll just read the therefore be it resolves. Therefore, be it resolved that the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee recommend Council approve that if and when the Township of Beckwith implements a 40 kilometer an hour speed limit between Ashton Creek Crescent and Beckwith Ninth Line Road, and on the southbound portion of Ashton Station Road, staff be directed to implement a similar speed limit change on the same road segment for northbound traffic on, or rather, sorry, Chair, uh, so... Uh, to on the southbound portion of Ashton Station Road, staff be directed to implement a similar speed limit change on the same road segment for northbound traffic on Ashton Station Road so as to bring the roadway into coherence and be it further resolved that city staff be directed to monitor similar speed limit changes on segments of roadways that lead into the City of Ottawa or border the City of Ottawa and where appropriate provide notice to the Ward Councillor about such changes and be it further resolved that where deemed appropriate in consultation with the Ward Councillor, staff exercise their delegated authority to ensure that speed limits at the boundary of the City of Ottawa are coherent with speed limits posted in neighbouring municipalities. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Brown, and those will be discussed in the future of the next meeting. I think Councillor Lowe have uh, the inquiry to have it on the record. Do you have it ready, Council? The inquiry. Yes. I guess I'll, I'll read this uh, off my screen. Just here. to have it on the record. Yeah. So um, I, I guess that committee direct legal services staff to provide broad information about potential increased exposure to liabilities as a result of warranted locations remaining on the list for a very long time and to look at whether or not there have been any claims brought to the city that provided allegations the city was aware of a situation and did not take steps to correct it. And that's in relation to the uh, traffic signals inquiry. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. 
uh, and then uh, we have no inquiries. Uh, 12 we have no other business our next meeting it's thursday may 2nd 2024 and we're gonna have a motion to adjourn at 11 o'clock carried thank you